video. Okay. I was I just sent you a notification. If you click on start video, it will immediately start your video. Um, yeah. Okay. Here's that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi. Now I see you. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Fine. Yes. So how is uh, okay. Burn doing uh, in COVID times? Uh, it, it, it's special, but at the moment we uh, it was not that that problematic. We were all preparing and uh, we were kind of waiting for the tsunami, but it kind of never came. Okay. So it was very in Switzerland. Different areas of Switzerland were uh, were differently affected. So the southern part of Switzerland was much more affected than we were. Okay. And now, just today, the government announced that uh, uh, things are now returning back to normal slowly. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good. No, uh, in a part like in India, I don't know. Like we are like a big country, and it's yeah. it, it is different for different states. Uh, are very complicated, but uh, we assume that we are gonna have a peak in by the end of May. So still. Still time to go. Uh, Manasi, hello. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Tell me, please. Am, am I audible or do I need to put in my headset? No, you know, you are audible. You are using a laptop, right? Yeah, I'm using a laptop. Uh, though I am a bit, I'm finding a bit difficult to hear. So is it possible that I put in a headset? So what is the difficulty that you're finding? Is it low? Uh, so yeah, the, the voice is a bit low. So when doctor... yeah, so you uh, so I uh, can you check the volume of your laptop if it is at the highest? Yeah, I've done it at the highest. I put it at the highest mode here. Yeah. And uh, in spite of that, you feel it is uh, a little low for you? Uh, uh, not for you, but uh, when Doctor Pascal was speaking, uh, it was not as clear. Okay, uh, then I think this uh, is got to do uh, with the the headset or. Uh, the mic that Dr. Pascal is using. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so would you prefer uh, talking with the headphones on or uh, uh, without it also could do? What do you think? I think I will keep the headset on because I, I mean, in my, in my office and the room is quite high. All right. Uh, there will be some, some echoing. So I think it's, it's better to use the, the headset. Headset. Okay, perfect. If you can hear me clearly, it's okay like that? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I mean, I'm not quite sure whether it is the voice or it is your accent, which... Uh... No. Uh, it's not the accent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not the accent for sure. Like, uh, so uh, it has to do something uh, with probably the settings, this, the the a bit of resonation. Do, do you think? Do you consider it a bit? Uh, it's a it's a bit of resonance there. Mm -hmm. uh, I I don't find the resonance. Uh, I find uh, that his voice is not uh, like the words are not clear. Yeah, words are not clear. So yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, Dr. Pascal, can can you try without the headphones if possible? Um, try. I can. If, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's much better. Yeah, this is clearer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, because normally this is this is worse because it's because of the room, but then it's better. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's louder and uh, a bit clearer. Okay. Then let's let's do it like that. Yeah, it's not for my head too. So, <laughs> and and you are going to hospital daily, like we have like working in shifts, like in India we are working in shifts. We we used to do that until last week. This week was uh, the first week where we kind of have normal working hours again. Okay. It's not the, the normal program and the normal normal workload yet. Okay. 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 So I'm waiting for the other chairpersons to join in. Uh, uh, Dr. Call usually logs in five minutes before. So uh, okay. in about two minutes, we should have him. OK. So I've already informed Dr. Gaurav. So uh, we'll be having two chairpersons uh, along with me. I'll be moderating. And uh, what we usually do is uh, 
I'll introduce the chairperson and you, and then uh, you can go ahead with the talk. And uh, in the end, uh, we can have a question answer session depending upon uh, like how many questions are you okay with. So maybe 10, 15 minutes. So that makes it a one hour session. And uh, 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 so that's it. So if that's fine with you or you want any changes. Uh, no, it's okay. Okay. I think that we have uh, around maybe 45 minutes, half an hour to 45 minutes, something like that. I, I didn't get you, sorry. I, I think that we have like 45 minutes, 30 okay. to 45 minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that should be fine. So uh, usually uh, people have a lot of questions. So we in India are going through a transition, like contrary to burn, you have been doing it since uh, early 20s. We in India have, have like started doing it very late, I would say 2015 onwards when these positive trials came up. But I know Burn since the time of Dr. Shroth. Yes. <laughs> people have been doing some amazing work. Uh, it really, and Miriam is a good friend of mine, uh, Miriam Helner. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He keeps talking yeah. about like, so we have been in the same master's program in Austria. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you told me. Yeah, yeah so yeah. So we, we, we keep talking about it and how is it changing. So uh, we still have a long way to go. Like I hope uh, all these talks and uh, uh, these things make a difference eventually in the stroke care. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's very interesting to see how uh, different, different countries uh, are, are trying to, to organize their stroke treatment or stroke networks. It's very, very different. Yeah, it's very different. It's on so many things. So there is, there is no blueprint that, that fits, fits for everywhere. Exactly, exactly. So for us, the main problem is, uh, 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 main problem is uh, uh, the money, the economy in India. So we have a lot of patients, but it's about the economy and the government sector isn't that supportive. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. Mansi, hello, Mansi. Uh, yes, I'm there. Tell me, please. Doctor Gaurav is saying that uh, he, he the, the, the message is asking him to wait. Yeah, I think because he's uh, logging in through the delegate uh, uh, login, delegate ID. All right. So what we will do is we are just four minutes away from nine. So okay. it's it's only the panelists in yet. No attendees are in. So do you think I should open the session or we wait for Doctor Paul? What uh, do you want? Uh, I guess we should wait for Dr. Call. Do you want me to call him? At least. Uh, yes, if it is possible for you, you could do that. Give Else, me, me to do it, me, I'll do it. Give me a second. And please uh, take in Dr. Gaurav. Do you want me to call him? No, also? you can't. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Gaurav will be able to take only once we open uh, the session for all the attendees. To talk. But he has got the mail, so he should be able to do it. Yes, he, if he is using the mail, then he will be able to log in. If he's not, then he won't. Okay, okay. Give me a second. I'll talk to yes, you. Yes, yes. So, in the meanwhile, uh, when you are talking to Dr. Uh, Gaurav, do you want me to talk, talk to Dr. Paul? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sir, uh, sir, you have mail. If you have a login, you will be able to log in. Karenge, to aapko ये कह रही थी कि मानसी कह रही थी कि आप शायद डेलीगेट वाले से कर रहे थे इसलिए नहीं हो रहा था अच्छा मानसी he is doing yeah. mail through the mail uh, then Dr. Yes, Gaurav is, if, is is it asking him for a password uh, no sir is it asking you for the password or something Okay, so it says that uh, uh, it ha uh, uh, the, it says that uh, the host has started and you will be signing in after the meeting starts. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. So, so he he's uh, he's uh, going there with the delegate login. But he has got the mail. He has got the mail. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. I have already joined. Him. Okay. So Pascal is also there. So what I will do is let's let's just open the session and we yeah, will open the session. For... Yeah, open yes, the yes, session yes, and yes, take Dr. Yes. Gaurav in first. Yes. Hello. So she'll take you in.
so they are taking some time to join in so uh, it's uh, we call it the fine night webinar i guess uh, in some ways covid has been good for especially the residents and the fellows the young people we yeah. the young people are getting to see so many speakers and like uh, this good speaker there are long webinars today sbi and also is having one webinar so yeah dr gorav has joined in yes and i just spoke to dr paul he also will be joining in okay Dr. Gaurav is uh, not yet on the video. He he'll come. He'll come. Oh, yeah. Take some time to uh, set up everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dr. Gaurav is uh, the chief of the neuro intervention unit, Dr. Pascal, in Medanta, the Medicity, uh, where I am uh, also working. So, hello he, everyone. The person he has had his training in Canada. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. I hope you are doing okay. Yes. Yes. I hope you too. So, Manasi, should we begin? Ah, uh, yeah. I think I'll just talk to uh, Doctor Call once again because I can't see him in the participant list. Okay. I can't see him yet. You want me to call him? I'll call him again. Ah, uh, no, no. Let me call him because. Uh, okay. 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 Any anything where he needs help. Yeah, 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 sure. so you are having some protocol in covid during covid time like is it like you have particular protocol when you treat covid positive or covid suspects yeah i mean in terms of 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 hygiene yes so the room has to be clean and so on you will come just uh, for being the next patient so you have to so once you use it the the lab for a positive patient do you uh, like how do you manage for the next patient for example if two patients come one by one and you don't have the other lab ready how do you go about it well fortunately we don't have uh, we don't have elective cases at the moment so we have two okay. anti suites and then uh, always one anti suite would be ready if there is a second emergency coming uh, okay At the moment, we just have to to clean it, and then we have to wait for for half an hour. Oh, so okay. To clean all the surfaces, and then we wait for half an hour in order also for the uh, for the air to be ventilation to kick in and for the air to be kind of exchanged. But this is not a problem. We have two anti suites, and we stopped all elective cases. So we still have infrastructure. If one room is occupied. For an emergency, we would just go to the other room with, with the other one, if necessary. Yeah. Yeah. So we are uh, like we haven't had any suspect. We had one patient yesterday night, which didn't have a large vessel occlusion. So we didn't have to do it. So and, we we have. I'm aware that we have had a, a proven positive patient in the Anjo so far. So. And yeah. have found the increase in number of young strokes as it as it's coming uh, all over the net. And I also saw Michael Brennan speaking about it. I don't know. I mean, we now are like it's like five 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 weeks, six weeks. We are in this um, situation, and I think we have to analyze it in retrospect. I, I don't know whether we had fewer strokes or more. I don't know. I have the impression nothing has. In terms of for strokes, nothing has changed that much. Okay. Uh, but it's always like when you have when you have nothing to do, it's always uh, uh, six more hours than if you if you're very busy. You forget when yeah. you do. It is, yeah. So I'm I'm looking forward, and I mean all the all the analysis now that will come from from the all from all the neurological societies and so on, whether there is an increase or decrease in in stroke treatment, will be very interesting. Okay. 
Manasi, should we begin? Manasi? Um, Dr. Vineet, uh, would you, would you, uh, Dr. Call is uh, trying to log in. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Sudhir is here. So, I guess can can we start, sir? Yeah, I think starts. I thought yeah. it was started. Huh? Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, Dr. Murdasini. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, go ahead, Vinit. Yeah. So it's a pleasure welcoming Dr. Murdasini, who is. Uh, Head of the Neurointerventional Unit and from University Institute of Diagnostic and Interventional Neuroradiology from Bern, Switzerland. And without wasting any time, we have uh, we also have Chairperson Dr. Gaurav Goel, uh, Chief of the Neurointerventional Unit from Medanta, the Medicity, and Dr. Subhash Kaul. Uh, Dr. Kaul is finding some problems, so he's yet to join. So I'll request Dr. Murdasini to uh, to begin uh, the session. Yeah, so thank you first of all for the invitation to speak. It's a, it's a big honor and a big, big pleasure having this, this opportunity. So, uh, Vini Banga gave me the, uh, the topic of to talk about triage uh, of patients for, for thrombectomy. So, so, you all are aware that uh, the, in the recent years, uh, a huge change has occurred in the treatment of acute ischemic stroke with the publication of the randomized controlled trials, starting with Mr. Clean in 2014. Uh, a large amount of, of uh, clinical evidence has been gathered so that the, the, the approach in treatment of that acute ischemic stroke has been completely changed. And then the vascular uh, stroke treatment has become the new standard of care for large vessel occlusion in ischemic strokes. Um, when I start, I, I'd like always to point out some of the very important principles I think we always have to keep in mind uh, when we talk about acute stroke treatment. So first of all, stroke is an emergency and our decisions are made in an emergency setting. So we have to decide fast in order to treat fast. And uh, we have always to consider that, that we may not have all uh, necessary information we, we, would like, we would like to have, but we have to be quick in our decision making. The second important point is endovascular the therapy is effective. Uh, the randomized control trials have showed that and the reason why it's effective is because of its high recognition rate. So it's the recognition that counts. And the third thing you have to keep in mind is always keep in mind that the next stroke coming to the hospital will be an individual patient with an individual brain and it's not a cohort of patients. An important thing is we also need to remember what is the natural history of large vessel occlusion in acute ischemic stroke. And there we see uh, that large vessel occlusion has quite a poor prognosis with M1 occlusions leading in almost 90% to bad outcome uh, with a mortality rate of over 10%. Uh, also T occlusion, tandem occlusion, and basal artery occlusion, uh, of course have very good outcome if not treated, if not recanalized. So this is always what we need to keep, keep in mind if we um, decide to treat the patient or not, what might be his uh, prognosis uh, uh, in the natural history of the disease. And also a point I always like, like to mention first before starting to go into further detail is the term of futile recanalization. Um, Futile, I think the definition should be that there is no clinical improvement despite the successful endovascular mechanization. And there might be three different reasons for that. Either the clinical outcome will be bad anyway, so it doesn't matter what we do, whether it's nothing or it's to be. The clinical outcome will be good anyway, because it's a good patient, he has, uh, he has a, a good, good outcome anyway. Or the intervention risk is too high or uh, too low chance uh, of, of benefit. So I think these are the important points to keep in mind when, when someone talks about futile recommendation. Uh, Dr. Pascal, can I just interrupt you? Uh, the lot of participants are saying that your voice is getting echoed. It's not clear. Is it a way uh, we can fix that? Like maybe, I don't know. Is it better now? 
uh, maybe the room is closed and that's why the voice is getting echo yes that's that's the room uh, okay. maybe you can uh, come nearer the uh, laptop okay. is it better now yeah it's better now it's better okay. now i tried to speak like that sorry about that we, we are sorry uh, we are sorry but just the participants were sending us messages so that uh, okay i hope now it's better um and also what has changed during the recent years is how we look at clinical outcome. You know that uh, traditionally the clinical outcome is measured by the modified ranking scale uh, from zero to six, where zero to two is considered to be favorable or good clinical outcome with an independent patient. And everything that is three or more is, is bad outcome. So all the studies are kind of using a dichotomized outcome measure. However, we know, of course, that if you even if you can shift patients from five to four, or from even from five to three, or from four to three, this is of course a clinical benefit, and this is efficiency of, of, of the treatment, and this has not been respected or, or taken into consideration in the previous studies. And of course, what we do not want to do is, of course, worsen the patients, so shift patients from four to five. Uh, or shift patient from, from six to five, so to, to treat patients who will end up in a, in a vegetative state or with a severe disability. And if you look at, at all the data and all the studies, there is a clear hint that we shift patients towards a better uh, modified ranking scale uh, in general, and we're not shifting them to a worse modified ranking scale. So the treatment itself doesn't, doesn't seem to have a, a, a negative effect. Another important point to know is that endovascular stroke treatment is quite safe. And the interventional complications are very low, and also the rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhages in the stroke, in the randomized controlled stroke trials, uh, are, are very low. So it seems to be, in general, a very safe uh, treatment modality. And you all know the randomized controlled trials. Um, this is the Hermes collaborators meta-analysis, putting together the data on a patient level basis of, of five randomized controlled trials. And they have um, shown, very impressively shown that the number needed to treat according to the inclusion criteria of those, of those studies is very, very low with 2.6 uh, patients you need in order to improve a patient in outcome. This is a very, very efficient therapy if you compare it to other uh, treatments in medicine, uh, like, for, for example, PCI, uh, where the number needed to treat is somewhere around 30. This is highly and very efficient. In the meta-analysis, they did some post hoc analysis of subgroups. And uh, that's where I want to start regarding, sorry, regarding the, um, the triage. So does age uh, play a decisive matter? Um, and the meta-analysis showed that all age groups benefit from revascularization therapy. Also, the elderly population, so octogenarians and even uh, nonogenarians, show treatment benefit uh, if you if you treat and recanalize that. But of course, if you getting older, uh, perceive the chance, the actual chance of having a good outcome, of course, is diminishing. We looked a couple of years ago at our patient co cohort uh, of endovascular, endovascularly treated patients, and we, then we, 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 we saw that there is more or less a linear relationship between age and outcome, and every, every increase uh, in age of 26 years around was associate, associated with an increase in the modified ranking scale of, of one point. However, we have seen in our data that age, on the other hand, is no risk factor for symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, or for lower uh, uh, recanalization success. So from a technical point of view, uh, there is, there is uh, no general reason not to treat uh, elderly patients. What about the severeness of stroke? So also here, measured by the NHS score, um, also here the meta-analysis showed that there is a cons consistent treatment effect of all stroke severity categories. There is still some uncertainty about very uh, mild sy symptomatic strokes, so strokes with an NHS of one, uh, one to five, but also there there are signals that these patient or patients can profit from an endovascular recanalization. Also here we looked at our data a couple of years, years ago, and we saw that uh, in non-thrombolized patients, 
so I mean, no, endovascularly treated patient, this is from the time where we mainly still did mainly intrauterial thrombolysis, but in patients with mild deficits and large vessel occlusion, um, uh, they deteriorated uh, significantly more often within the three months than the, 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 the recanalized, endovascularly recanalized uh, patient. And this was an important message for us. So if we have a low, a low NHS, uh, NHSS patients with a, um, with a lot of special occlusions, we rather tend to, uh, to treat him endovascularly if we have the feeling that this is going to be an, an, a, 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 an easy case. Also, what we more and more see and what we more and more have to, to revisit, revisit, revisit is the role of the infarct core or the infarct size. Um, the infarct core volume seems to me uh, seems to be a very promising general prognostic outcome factor. Of course, the bigger the infarct, the less likely you have a chance of having a good outcome. This seems kind of uh, this seems kind of logic, but there is very few data because these patients are, are have been all, usually been um, excluded from the clinical trials, and the few data we had uh, looked very discouraging. So we very low rate of, of good outcome, always measured, remember, as the modified ranking scale from zero to two. Um, however, again, back to the Hermes collaborators, uh, they looked at aspects as a surrogate for infarct size or infarct volume, and they found also treatment effect uh, for all aspect cap cap uh, categories, um, also in very low aspect ca categories. However, again here, a lot of patients have been excluded with low aspects from those studies. So there is indeed more um, data needed for those low, low aspects or, or large volume stroke patients. Um, but how could, it, how could these results be explained? So has it just to do with the limited intra-observer agreement of the aspect score? Or is it by preservation of penumbra by endovascular therapy? Or is it uh, just by reduction of edema, by recanalization of endovascular therapy? Uh, which uh, might be uh, of benefit for the brain and may also lead to a reduction for need for hemiacranectomy. We also looked at our patients. We very early on started also to treat patients with large infarcts and then from a center where we're lucky enough uh, to have MR available as, as, a, uh, as the first uh, image modality for stroke patients. So we could use PWI and do volumetry of the infarct volumes. And also here, what we could see was that every third patient with a large lesion, so more than 100 milliliters of, 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 of inf infarct core, reached a, a favorable outcome in case of, of sufficient recanization. So uh, if you recognize those patients, you give them a considerable chance of, of, of improving. And what we also have seen is that there is no cutoff value. So we cannot say that there is a, a threshold just a, a, just defined as a volume where you can say it makes no sense to, to, to recanalize anymore. Uh, and we've also seen that younger patients do considerably better than older patients. Uh, but again, for older and younger patients, the, the, the prerequisite is successful uh, recanalization. And of course, these patients, we have to uh, look more closely at these patients, so of large, large infarcts and future trials should include those patients. And there are also um, now uh, trials ongoing looking at these super populations. So the last thing that is missing is uh, the time window. So we have been randomized control trials for thrombectomy in a late time window published in 2018. And until then, uh, the data showed that beyond 7.3 hours, there is no benefit of, of endovascular therapy uh, anymore, uh, and the guidelines at the time they advocated the rigid therapeutic time window. But we all know that every brain is is different; that there are individual variations in compensatory mechanisms, so that probably uh, not not everyone and uh, not everyone is is the same. And another clinical problem is that the the symptom onset uh, is unknown or uh, or late presenting in a considerable amount of stroke patients being referred to, to hospitals. Depending on the it's around 40% uh, are either wake up strokes or, or strokes with unknown symptoms. So, 
The clinical outcomes do not only depend on time of drip perfusion, but also on the function of tissue perfusion sustained by collateral flow and regional susceptibility to early skin changes. So it's very individual. And you know there were two randomized controlled trials, the DORM trial and the diffuse trial, looking uh, at, at this patient subgroup. Uh, and don't go too much into detail, just for you to remember, um, the DORM trial included patients from 6 to 24 hours from last known to be well. The diffuse three trial included patients from 6 to 16 hours from last uh, seen well. And the third trial was the inclusion criteria was mainly based on a clinic, clinical imaging, uh, uh, clinical imaging core mismatch. Uh, so the clinical information was kind of the surrogate for the penumbra. And in the diffuse three trial, it was purely an uh, uh, imaging criteria, inclusion criteria. So uh, they were measuring the infarct core and the, uh, and the penumbra and the, the, the mismatch ratio. And this was done by the automatic software. You know it, it's the rapid software uh, based on, on, on the, the their defined uh, thresholds for, uh, for impact for and, and penumbra. The outcome was very impressive. In the DORM trial, there was a 36% difference in good outcome uh, between the thrombectomy group and the control group with a number needed to treat again from le as, for less than uh, uh, three. And we have a similar treatment effect seen in the diffuse three trial. Also here, 28% 20, difference in good outcome between the two treatment groups. What is also important is that the retinization rates were high. The, the rates of symptomatic intercanal hemorrhages were low. So again, it seems to be a, a safe treatment mo modality. And also the mortality rates were uh, tended to be lower compared to the control group. So we're not just uh, improving most of the patients, but you're also uh, reducing mortality uh, in general by treating and recognizing the patients. So what, what have we learned? So from those studies, and that's the therapy up to 24 hours after symptom onset in selected patients compared with medical therapy associated with an improved clinical outcome and highly likelihood of achieving independency. Uh, advanced imaging uh, can help to select those patients using infarct core and penumbra measurements. Uh, the, the, the clinical core mismatch uh, seems to be a relevant selection criteria independent of the time of, of presentation. And the, these studies allowed us to treat wake-up strokes uh, and to, to show that they benefit from endovascular treatment. A uh, patient group that before those treatments has been uh, excluded uh, from, from, from these treatments. However, can we generalize these results? So the inclusion criteria were very, very restrictive. Um, so we still have a limited understanding of the treatment benefits of late presenting patients, for example, with larger infarct core and small penumbra. Uh, but they, they both kind of showed us the proof of concept that we can select patients uh, and still be able to treat them uh, outside of, of the traditional uh, rigid time windows. The results of those studies have been implemented very quickly into stroke guidelines, for example, in the American uh, guidelines from the American Heart and Stroke Association, uh, where the recommendation was included that according to the, to, to the inclusion criteria of those, those trials, um, patient with unknown uh, symptom onset or um, wake up stroke can be, can be included and can be treated. Um, we also, there have also been um, further analysis of those trials and um, if we say 24 hours, but is this, is this a, again a new uh, time window? And analyzing the diffuse three patients, they have found that 20% of patients, uh, they still have a target mismatch according to the diffuse three trial uh, more than 24 hours after last last seen, seen well. Uh, and when, when you do, even in, in the patient in the control group they, who did not recanalize, they still did worse. They still, uh, even if they had good collaterals and, and, and this persistent target mismatch was there, at the end they, they, still, uh, they, they, they still did work because they were, because they were not recanalized. So basically, uh, probably there is no time limit at all, but it's individual time limit. 
And further studies have tried to further expand and see whether we can expand or, or, or loosen the inclusion criteria to uh, include more patients even after 24 hours. Uh, and uh, uh, this has been shown in this subgroup analysis. So if we have to triage and if we have to do our decision making, so for me the question is rather what how and what uh, what arguments can I use to reduce treatment? Are there any arguments? Are there any isolated uh, arguments where I can refuse treatment? So we have seen age is not an isolated argument. Even even older patients profit. Is it the NHSS score? Is it the aspect score? Is it lifetime window? Is it mismatch? Is it uh, the, the infarct problem, and as I showed, there is still a subgroup of patients that will uh, significantly profit from, from revascularization. So, what else is, is there? So, can we use clinical prognosis scale? And there has been a, a, a nice paper looking at the and uh, validating uh, clinical scores in regard to their outcome prediction, and it has nicely shown that. Uh, even the best performance case, uh, they had a too low prognostic accuracy uh, uh, to say whether someone might not benefit from, from endovascular treatment. So also clinical stroke prognosis scores uh, are not useful. So at the end, it comes down to money as usual. So can we do cost-effective analysis and say that under certain instances, stroke treatment is not uh, uh, cost-effective anymore? And this has been done in several studies and in several um, uh, healthcare uh, systems. Uh, for example, here from studies from, from the United States, from the UK, and the, and the Swedish healthcare system. And they all found that in general, endovascular stroke treatment is cost effective. And even in, up to, in patients up to 100 years of age, uh, in general, you can say that uh, stroke treatment is cost effective. So I think this is a very, very important message. Um, if you have to negotiate with, 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 with governmental bodies, with the administration, uh, when it comes to uh, financing uh, stroke care and developing stroke networks, uh, if you if you argue if you can argue in favor of stroke treatment from an economical point of view, uh, then you 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 have a very very good bargaining chip in your hand. So after everything I've said, is it now Matt Cowboy's time? We just treat everyone? No, of course not. I think it's very important to realize that at the end, the treatment decision is individualized, multi-parametric decision, taking uh, different parameters into account, age, symptom onset, the lesion, uh, the NHS score, the inclusion side, impact for the risk of the intervention, and the overall uh, life situation of a patient that he has a good or a bad quality of life uh, already pre stroke. And then you will have kind of points which point very, very much in favor of, of treatment. And in these cases, you would, you would treat the patient. And there are some instances probably you, you have to think whether the, the full picture of the patient's situation uh, is, is reason enough uh, not, not to treat or uh, to treat. So, for example, this would be an example of a patient uh, where we did not treat with a large threshold occlusion, showing already a, a, a hemispheric, huge hemispheric infarction, uh, was very pop, stroke was found, um, had an M1 occlusion, uh, or a carotid T occlusion, sorry, and there was really already on the CT scan, was, everything was demarcated on the right hemisphere. So, here we would be uh, quite reluctant to treat uh, this patient. There is also always a discussion of post posterior circulation stroke when you have large uh, um, PW eye lesions in the brain stem or in the midbrain, whether you should treat those patients, whether you do not want to produce patients surviving but, but being in a persistent vegetative state. Um, this is usually referred to as, as a typical case where you probably do not treat. However, we have to keep in mind that sometimes these diffusion lesions are reversible. So at the end, you still never know. And what we also have to keep in mind that that's also, again, data from, from our center looking at uh, the outcome of uh, patients after basal arch occlusions, occlusion, how they did, how they further improved or deteriorated after three months. Because in all the studies, the outcome is measured after three months, and we don't know really what's happening after that. 
and we looked at bell basilar or arterial occlusion uh, patients, and we saw that after three months, there is still a significant amount of patients, even with initially high modified ranking score, which still, still might improve. So uh, there is a recovery potential beyond uh, three months for, for many patients. Also keep that in mind. So what we, at the end, in triaging patients, what we really want is, or the big question is, can we predict advantage tissue survival with mechanical thrombectomy successfully applied compared to the natural cause of the disease in the presence of sufficient versus insufficient mechanization? And there we move away from the cohort-based uh, data, from the cohort-based treatment decision to an individualized treatment uh, decision, and we're moving away from uh, strict time windows and we're moving towards a tissue and eloquence-based approach in patient selection. And I show this just to illustrate that one way maybe, it's one possible way, is maybe that we use artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we have a very active group at our hospital and they were uh, developing a software like that, uh, which was be trained and using algorithm in order to predict the, uh, the outcome based on imaging data, but also including kind of clinical data. So whether a patient will be successfully recalized or not. And what you get here is uh, maps which showing you kind of the, the best case scenario with recalization and kind of the worst case scenario without recalization, showing you infarct volumes. And that's based on MR. And the beauty of MR is that you have uh, a lot of tissue features, tissue parameters you can put into the algorithm and into the equation. And uh, in, in this algorithm, for example, we, we put in almost 300 tissue features. And of course, then we are still uh, uh, overestimating final impact volumes if we compare it to the ground two, but we are much more precise than the currently available um, uh, automatic uh, post-processing software, so, so, such as Rapid, uh, which are using uh, linear models and one threshold and one based on one diffusion uh, parameter. So this is, I think, uh, something promising it's still a little bit in the future. And it points us again to the, to the question, um, is, is the relevant unit uh, for brain function, uh, is it really measured in volume? Is it really the volume? Is it really measured in milliliters? And of course, you all need all just to say, no, of course not, there are different eloquence. And the small strategic, strategically located infarct can have a much worse outcome than probably a larger non-strategically non-eloquent uh, brain area that is uh, brain area that is that is infarcted. So we also have to keep in mind or to look at stroke patients more from an eloquent based uh, uh, approach. And also we have to refine our uh, understanding of penumbra and, and include also uh, the topography in penumbra infarct core uh, estimation. Um, and what you can see here is is from a paper. And um, that's the classical depiction of the penumbra. It's the fried egg depiction, but we know that penumbra is not uh, a fried egg, but it's, it's, it's developing in all the directions a little bit differently. Uh, for, the, for example, here, the expansion of the infarct in this case is, 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 is less anteriorly than it is, uh, uh, than it is posteriorly. And of course, it depends also what is, what is included, what elephant area is included in the infarct core and, and in the, in the potential uh, tissue at risk, which is salvageable in the penumbra. So the, the, the tissue uh, and the location may play uh, an important role in further refinement of our understanding uh, of prognostic outcome uh, for stroke patients. And if we go back to our machine learning or artificial intelligence approach, um, I have shown you maps where you get this volume. So you get a volume back uh, uh, in case of mechanization or not. And as I said, of course, it's important where this volume is. So we put on this algorithm uh, 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 an atlas, a brain atlas, and we correlated it with the eloquence of the certain brain areas. And the, the best correlation was, of course, the sensimotor areas, the superior longitudinal fascicle, the body, and the corticospinal tract. And just at the end of all that, is the volume as such. So the volume as such is not the most important uh, prognostic factor if you look at that. 
So this opens to the second part of my of my talk, where uh, we have a special interest in, and that's the role of uh, uh, intravenous uh, thrombolysis in patients that are undergoing mechanical thrombectomy. You know that intravenous thrombolysis has been shown to be effective and safe in uh, a lot of, of subgroups of patients, in all ethnic groups, in dissections, and so on, uh, and so on. But you also know that there are limitations of in intravenous thrombolysis. You know that there is a rapidly decreasing efficacy, so the number needed to treat within the time window of 0 to 90 minutes is 4.5, and it increases to uh, more than 14 uh, after 180 minutes. Also, you know uh, from this uh, very famous study from the group of Kiel uh, that uh, large thrombi are much, much less uh, responsive to intervenous thrombolysis than if you have a, a 8, 9, 10 millimeter long thrombus that the chance of retinization using intervenous thrombolysis is, is almost zero. And of course, there are further limitations, wake up and siesta strokes. However, now with the published wake up stroke trial, including MRI as, a, as, a, as, a, as an imaging modality, uh, we can also partially include uh, those patients nowadays, but there are other absolute and relative contraindications for any thrombolysis. And from an endovascular point of view, uh, it's, the use of endovascular uh, of, of, uh, of intravenous thrombolysis may, uh, may pose some, some problems in an endovascular procedure in case you, you want to use further intraterial thrombolysis or you need, you need to use antiplatelets or that anticoagulation regime you might, for example, need after, after the stenting procedure. So the question is whether IV, IVTPA is beneficial prior to mechanical thrombectomy and is IVTPA always necessary? And that's uh, kind of questioning the bridging approach. So what is what are the arguments uh, in favor of pitching? Of course, IV thrombolysis can be started earlier. This accounts for the, especially for the ship and trip patients, which are referred from a peripheral hospital to the thrombectomy center hospital. So already on the way to the uh, center hospital, uh, the treatment can start with IV thrombolysis. Um, IV TPA has been said to facilitate retinization. We will see whether this is, if this is true or not. Um, intravenous thrombolysis may improve reperfusion of small vessels. Um, also, there we don't have clear uh, scientific evidence. Um, but uh, some studies have shown that IV thrombolysis may delay mechanical thrombectomy if, of course, you're not organized and you have to wait for the intravenous thrombolysis to start and you're going into the end anyway. This might delay the endovascular treatment. And there are some, of course, some arguments against bridging. I already mentioned the pre localization rate in large vessels, the, the, the narrow time window, contraindications. IDTPA increases the risk of hemorrhage. It's a thrombolytic drug. Uh, so there is, of course, um, some side effects. It may produce thrombus dislocations, and I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, it has impact on healthcare costs. It is an additional uh, costly uh, uh, drug you have to apply. Uh, except for, in, for uh, intercerebral inter, inter hemorrhage, it may cause other life threatening complications such as angioedema, although it is there, but nevertheless. Uh, and, and that's now. Um, we, we look at two cohorts of patients, and one is the drip and shift patient coming to a peripheral hospital getting IV thrombolysis and being then transferred from mechanical thrombectomy to the center. And this is the patient cohort that is currently being examined in the uh, uh, race cat trial in Catalina. And that is the other uh, subgroup of patients, which we call the mothership patients, which are directly referred to a stroke center, to a thrombectomy capable center. Usually they get any thrombolysis and they are referred to the angio suite. But the question is whether we need to, to do this detour over intravenous thrombolysis or whether we can go directly to mechanical. And that is one of the questions that we are very interested in. Uh, um, try to, to answer that. So, which are the major arguments for intravenous thrombolysis uh, applied in patients on the going making mechanical thrombectomy? So, one argument is the pre interventional reperfusion, so the vessel is re recanalized and we don't need uh, the endovascular therapy. Uh, it may facilitate reperfusion success. and uh, does it influence symptomatic intercellular hemorrhage? So let's go to these three points. 
So there is some data, what is the pre-interventional reperfusion, what is the prevalence? And this data uh, shows that it's around 11%. But in this study, they put everything together, drip and ship patients, mother ship patients, uh, different occlusion patterns, different time windows, and they end up with a roughly 11%. But we already know from the ISC um, uh, trial that, of course, IV TPA is, is efficient in recanalizing, and it's more efficient than, than, uh, than no IV TPA, as you can see here. But you can see that the timeline, it starts at 60 minutes, and that, of course, is, is, is too late. So we hate that much. So we looked at, at the time dependency of pre-interventional reperfusion in our patient in our patients that were referred to our hospital, and we divided them into the mothership patients in red and into the drip and ship patients uh, in blue. And as you can see, the drip and ship patients have a considerably higher chance of of the uh, recanalization of the bridging IV thrombolysis uh, than the mothership patients. So the mothership patients. ICA and then one occlusions have very, very low uh, pre-interventional reperfusion rates, mainly because the drug has, has less time uh, to be active when a patient is then just quickly, re quickly referred to the, to the angiosphere for mechanical thrombectomy. We also, when we talk about pre-interventional reperfusion, uh, what do we mean with that? If we look at endovascular, endovascular studies, we grade the recanalization success according to the TIKI scale which is not the case for IV thrombolysis studies. And we looked at all our patients, our mothership patients, who came to the angio suite, and we looked that there was a change of occlusion site uh, between just the imaging before and now the, the, the first angio run uh, in the angio suite. So change of occlusion site. And in over 700 patients, we found a change of occlusion site compared to the pre-intervention imaging in around 10%. Um, in around 3%, it was kind of just moving the thrombus a little bit. It was still TK0 to 1, so the vessel was still occluded, but it was maybe not a proximal MR occlusion, but maybe a mid or distal MR occlusion. Around 6% showed indeed a partial recanalization, more than TK2A. Half of it was TK2B, so around 3%. And in around 2%, we saw perfusion worsening, so that, uh, for example, the, the thrombus was dislodged into the carotid T or from part of the thrombus bird is lodged into the uh, anterior cerebral artery circulation. Then, um, does, it, does IV thrombolysis in patients undergoing uh, to mechanical thrombectomy in mothership patients have an influence on the reperfusion success? And we did a meta-analysis looking at this uh, mothership patients uh, um, in the literature, and we divided them, and that's, I think, an important point, into the patients who were referred directly to the angio suite because they were ineligible for IVTPA, so they had contraindications for IVTPA, and compared to patients that would have been eligible for IVTPA, but for some reasons the interventions have chosen to skip IVTPA. And that, this is an important differentiation because these are two different patient groups. These are like apples and pears, and so if you compare, you have to compare those uh, those groups separately. And we have seen that indeed the direct mechanical thrombectomy patients, they are high loads for atrial fibrillation and for cryosurgical vascular events, uh, and they were also tended to be treated later. So they clearly have a, a different clinical state and there's a clearly different patient population. So how did it look? So first we looked at the reperfusion success. So we find a sticky 2 b and 3 and we saw that the overall there is no significant different rates of successful recanalization, and there is just a non-significant trend for high rates of successful reperfusion in the IVT eligible patients. So there is no clear hint that IVTPA shows a clear benefit in terms of reperfusion success. Now you may say, well, you looked at ticky 2 b and ticky 3 uh, so maybe the rate of TK3 was high because all the TK2Bs, they were reopened and ended up being a TK3 TK uh, scale because of the IV, IV thrombolysis. And if you just look at the TK3 uh, grades, there is no difference, no effect uh, in, in patients going directly to mechanical thrombectomy or patients who are receiving IV thrombolysis previously. So the third point is the difference in symptomatic intercellular hemorrhage. 
Also here there was overall a non-significant trend towards higher rates of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage in IVTPA uh, patients, uh, but there was no treatment group effect. So there seems to be a trend of lesser hemorrhage, but it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not significant and it's not clear from, from this meta-analysis. So if we put all these factors together, so pre-interventional reperfusion, reperfusion success, symptomatic hemorrhage, but at the end what counts is the clinical outcome. So is there a difference in clinical outcome, a difference in functional uh, independence? And again, there was a, a sort of a non-significant trend overall for low rates of functional outcome in the direct mechanical thrombectomy patients. But again, those were not, mostly not eligible for IVTPA, so they, uh, they are a different patient group, a sicker patient group, a patient group presenting uh, later. But if you look just at the eligible patients who were who would have been eligible and mechanical thrombectomy was performed directly, there was no difference in the rates of functional outcome. So can we put some arguments together for an individualized uh, decision against IVTPA in mothership patients undergoing that mechanical thrombectomy? So in mothership patients, uh, if the angio team is ready, you are usually very quick in the angio. So there is the time dependency of IV IVTPA. Uh, which, which probably is, is uh, uh, which is too short. So the drug has not enough time to to, to be efficient. Uh, if we have carotid or larger thrombi, uh, we know there is a is a low efficiency, and there is uh, around two percent risk of perfusion worsening uh, according to our data. And of course, there are certain other uh, um, clinical conditions like microbleeds, striatal infarction, diabetic, high aspect score, where we know. These patient subgroups, they have per se a higher risk of symptomatic intracellular hemorrhage. So if you would find an argument that justifies not giving IVTPA and probably uh, putting them under a, an additional risk uh, for, for increasing symptomatic intracellular hemorrhage uh, would be nice if you could choose, if you have good reasons not to give it. And of course, in tandem lesions where you might, might up ending, uh, putting a stent, uh, um, uh, and giving additional uh, antiplatelet medications and potentially uh, increasing symptomatic intercellular hemorrhage. So what's the summary of evidence then? So the best evidence for bridging uh, benefit is the pre-interventional reperfusion. As I sh showed, it's much larger or much bigger in, in, in the drip and ship than in and very low in the mothership uh, 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 patients. Um, there is no real evidence uh, for facilitation of mechanical reperfusion. Uh, as far as we can derive it from the literature. Uh, and most of the literature that has been included in, the, in this meta-analysis um, is biased because uh, they, uh, they, they put to, usually put together direct mechanical thrombectomy patients, uh, which would have been eligible and would, would not have been eligible for IVTPA uh, together. And of course, as I, uh, as I emphasized, these are different patient populations. So considering proximal large vessel occlusions, there is a substantial indication for non-inferiority, there are weak indications for superiority, and that's what we call a clinical equipoise, and therefore we need some randomized control trial because it's a relevant question. Maybe you can achieve equal victimization results without giving IVTPA in mothership patients. Maybe we can decrease hemor hemorrhage rates. Maybe we can avoid thrombus migration. Uh, maybe we can still have similar or even better outcomes. Uh, and maybe we can reduce the cost by skipping RTPA. And you know, there are several studies ongoing currently looking at these principles. Uh, we are center from Bern as well as the, um, uh, um, is the, um, the leading center for the, the SWIFT direct trial, uh, which is ongoing at the moment. Uh, there is another European trial, the Mr. Clean non IV trial, who is also looking at the same question. There was the direct mechanical thrombectomy trial in China, which is um, which is already uh, uh, finished, and the publication or the presentation of the results are, are awaiting. And there are further studies ongoing in Australia and in, in, in Japan. So, in summary, regarding triage of, of stroke patients for mechanical thrombectomy, uh, it's not possible to reliably predict or prevent futile recanalization in a middle stroke patient. Uh, and it's not the question whether this patient is going to be independent to have a, a modified ranking scale of 0 to 2, but whether this patient has the potential 
for for redu reduction in in mobility. So that means a shift in the modified Rankine Ranky score, which is justifiable with a justifiable intervention risk in an individual patient setting. And intravenous thrombolysis will remain the standard of care, care for all patients with peripheral intracranial vessel infusions and frequent shift patients. Uh, but again, there is a trial needed to look at uh, the, the bridging patients undergoing uh, direct, uh, uh, bridging patients coming directly to a mechanical thrombectomy center and whether there is a direct mechanical thrombectomy, maybe uh, as efficient or maybe even more efficient. Uh, than, 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 than the bridging approach in those patients. And for the time being, uh, use both selection criteria for thrombectomy in, in, in your stroke patients, reduce the older selections, uh, the, the older selection, uh, use both road inclusion criteria and in clinical doubt uh, uh, treat. This is my final slide. I just wanted uh, to show you that we have put our internal stroke guidelines together in a little booklet. And we also made an uh, app out of it, which you can uh, download uh, for free. It's available in English. We have our internal stroke course here in Bern, which is mainly for European participants, which is held every year in winter. That's why it's called the winter school in January. Uh, but we also started uh, to do the same course for Asian particip participants. Uh, it has been held last year for the first time. <coughs> And we're going to, uh, to repeat the course. We have to postpone it this year, but we're going to repeat the, the course uh, next year. And this might be also interesting for, for, for Indian think, uh, participants. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Morrisini, for that very illuminating talk. Uh, <clears throat> Can we take question and answer session now, sir? Yes, sure. Please. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have received some questions from the audience, but before I start them, I'll ask my two fundamental questions. Uh, the first thing is uh, that when we uh, do the imaging, usually we do we do a clinical diffusion mismatch, or we do a perfusion diffusion mismatch. So my question is, if you talk of MRI because in India, most of the centers do MRI. In some centers, CT is also done, but most of the centers are equipped with MRI. So in a MRI setting, uh, in a stroke after six hours, in the extended period, is the diffusion imaging itself sufficient, or do we have to have perfusion also in the setting of MRI? Because we often debate this. A lot of people think that diffusion itself is enough to estimate the core. But some people say, no, you should have perfusion data also. So what is your uh, thought on I, I think there are different ways of approaching it. I think what the, the Dawn trial nicely showed is that, that you can use this core and clinical, uh, clinical mismatch uh, um, uh, uh, principle. So if the, if the patient has a small core and, and a huge deficit, uh, this is kind of a surrogate that there is, is a large penumbra. So you can, you can do that. Um, I'm talking about MR uh, because what, what we've seen is that a lot of patients, we see that um, half of the patients, two thirds of the patients we are treating at the end, in fact, they're not the study patients. They would have, none of them would have been excluded, uh, they would be excluded from the trials. So the gray, so called gray zone patients is indeed the majority of the patients and we are happy having the access to MRI uh, for those patients, so we get as much information as we can. But, but of course, if it's a, a clear-cut case with a with a small core in, in diffusion or no no uh, early ischemic signs on CT and the clinical core uh, and the clinical mismatch, then of course that 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 is a good um, a good selection criteria. Thank you. Thank so you very I, much I, for that. One more second. Just continuing the same discussion, uh, what the doctor call just said, do you have a different uh, imaging criteria for patients coming to you in within six hours and patients coming after six hours? Let's say if you are doing on an MRI or a CT, do you follow different criteria or is it the same? No, for, for, our, for our patients who refer directly to our center, uh, whenever possible, we do an MRI. Um, and that's uh, probably possible in, uh, in, in 70, 80% of our patients. Of course, if the patient is agitated, um, 
if, 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 if there is a suspicion of a bleeding anonymous ischemic stroke, they go to CT or whether there is anything unsure uh, whether they are compatible or not, they go, they go to CT. For the brain and shit patient, they will get images from outside hospitals of where the main CT. And when it's clear, then we just go directly to the angio suite and we usually do not repeat the, image, the, the imaging. Yeah. So we kind of use it both. But when, if you're not sure from the outside imaging, then we might, might repeat that. Yeah. But if it's a clear case, then there is no necess there is no necessary to, to do another MR, for example. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the other doubt which I have is that usually we use collaterals in decision making. So for instance, if a patient comes to us at eight hours, eight hours with a large vessel occlusion, we take the help of collaterals to, to, to decide whether we should intervene or not. So, so suppose we have got a patient who comes to us at eight hours uh, uh, and he has a large vessel occlusion, but he has poor collaterals. He has poor collaterals. He has almost no collaterals or very poor. Would you still take him or you will reject him? You, uh, we are we are usually not using collateral as a as a as an uh, uh, an imaging parameters for treatment decision. As I, as I said, it's a multi-parametric decision. So just put collaterals, yes or no, uh, as such, I think is, is is not a good criteria. I think you should see the, the whole picture of the patients. If you see that this patient already has a has a large impact and is an old patient, of course you might be more reluctant. But as I said, if it's a young patient and he has a large infarct, which is which is the the, the result of poor collaterals, uh, then you may maybe rather tend to treat this patient. So we are not using uh, collateral status of collateral as such. It is probably one of many parameters, but we are not using it as an absolute uh, inclusion or exclusion criteria. Yeah, there is a similar question that if we get a patient in the extended window, let's say at ten hours who has a clear-cut core deficit mismatch, but he has no occlusion. There's no occlusion, but there is a mismatch. So what do you do? Do you, do you give them IV thrombolysis at that time or you do nothing? Patient is clearly at 10 hours and there is no occlusion, but there is a mismatch. What do you do? You leave them alone? Uh, that's a good question for our neurologists. So, uh... Um, if you have a clear deficit and we don't, as I said, we would probably have an MR and so you can follow in the, the wake up, uh, the wake up trial the criteria uh, and you have a clear deficit and, and, and it's a stroke or a clinical stroke, uh, then you might still uh, consider IV thrombolysis if there's no other, um, if there is no even other. At, uh, uh, even, at, even at 10 hours, even at 10 hours. Yes, you might consider it. I'm not a neurologist. You might consider it if you have an MR and it's 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 it, it's a stroke and it's it's not clear uh, demarcated. Uh, but of course, these are very very rare cases now. These these are very exceptional cases, yeah. and of course, we have to be sure that it's not a stroke mimic. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask Laura, something yeah. in that? Yeah. So, like, we have seen a couple of cases like this that uh, we we do CT perfusion and there is a core mismatch, and the CT angiography is not showing occlusion. So our tendency is to even take these patients for DSA and once in a while we get surprised. Do you follow such protocols? Like what's your philosophy on that? Yes, I, I think that is one of the uh, one of the advantages of perfusion imaging. Um, if you look at, at, the, at the CT angle scan, if it's a, probably a more peripheral occlusion, you might sometimes not be sure whether there is an occlusion or not. And the perfusion scan depending on the on, 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 on the wedge or on the perfuse, the, the hyperperfuse area that might give you a hint that there indeed there is an M2 occlusion. Uh, and then in doubt we will take him also like you to the angio suite to check angiographically whether there is indeed a, 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 a vessel occlusion which might be uh, uh, reachable for thrombosis. So I think that's one of the advantages uh, of imaging. It might help you to find or to be sure that there is a, a potential uh, larger or, or accessible vessel occlusion, which might not, not always be clearly visible or clearly detectable just looking at the, the CTA. So the other question is that even though the window is 24 hours for a mechanical thrombectomy, but you in your experience have done at what maximum window? Have you gone beyond 24 hours? And if you have up to what maximum number of hours you have gone? After you, we we don't have time. We don't work with time windows. 
So Sorry. what is the maximum window you have gone? 72 hours, 80 yes. hours? If I remember right, we did recalibration procedures after three days, something like that. But that's, oh. always, that's very rare. Fortunately, the patients are earlier in the hospital, usually, so that's very rare. But, but again, with, with the imaging might, might help you uh, to see that these patients indeed they have very good collaterals, they have small infarct pores, the infarct is not flare demarcated. Of course, these are all imaging surrogates, but they might help you to, to include more patients for treatment. So we do MR and we do probably more of these advanced imaging procedures to include patients, not to exclude them. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. Uh, beginning, uh, continuing on that, we also in Medanta have done patients uh, within 30 hours. So we also like uh, though it's in the guideline till 24, but it's more of a tissue based, as you right, rightly said, rather than time based protocols. If the patient has symptom, there is a mismatch, and you have a large cell occlusion, it's better to go ahead and do it rather than waiting for the patient to deteriorate or uh, subsequently have an infarct. Yeah. So the other connected question is, which is often asked, it's often asked in all forums, that if the patient is having a T-junction as well as extracranial carotid block, so how do you approach them? Tandem lesions, question is about tandem lesions. Carotid, extracranial carotid as well as intracranial, how do you deal with that? So from a, from a technical point of view, we usually try to uh, recanalize the intracranial occlusion first, uh, and then on the way back, uh, we will see what's going on in the carotid artery. What is the reason? Is it a arteriosclerotic lesion? Is it a dissection? Is it a, a large thrombus? And depending on what we think it is, the approach is a little bit differently. So if, if it's a, a, an arteriosclerotic lesion, we are rather tending to stent it. Uh, so we, we see it as a symptomatic carotid stenosis, which need, needs to be treated early on. Uh, if it's a dissection, we're much, much more reluctant to stent in the acute phase because, as you know, um, uh, uh, extracranial cervical uh, ICA dissections uh, have, a, have a very good prognosis in, in the natural cause of the disease, so there is not necessarily need for stenting. The only stent when we see that there is a hemodynamic impairment or, the, or where we feel that there is a large thrombus mass lodging in the vessel and we have kind of protect uh, from, from further uh, embolization uh, or dislodgement of thrombus. Uh, and so that's, that's our, in short, that, that's our approach. Okay. Sir, do you, you would like to take yeah. other questions, uh, Dr. Bhagav, sir? Like uh, there are other questions in the panel, if you can. So, uh, one interesting part which you talked about was this artificial intelligence, that you, know, you are using uh, artificial intelligence to calculate the viable tissue. So one question from our participant, uh, Sony, Dr. Sony, is that, you know, what's the role in calculating the viable tissue? And uh, on follow-up of that, I have one question of its own that, you know, can the artificial intelligence also include the human factors like the age, you know, the kind of profession he is in, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, 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 I brought this example just but because I tried to illustrate some of, of our basic goals. I think artificial intelligence or this approach kind of is, is the approach for individualized treatment decision and individualized medicine, personalized medicine. And it's one way to go. And you're absolutely right. Of course, it's not just the volume and the imaging parameters, the, the eloquent area, but of course, it's a lot of clinical information. And this, of course, in a, in a, in a, a useful uh, algorithm has to be included. So to get more precise. And that's what I tried to show at the end, um, or I, I have tried to show with our um, uh, algorithm. Uh, it already kind of included a, a, a clinical information, uh, uh, mainly whether a patient is recognized or not. But of course, we need to add uh, other factors, uh, other factors, not just imaging features in, into, the, into the algorithm and getting to, to have a more precise uh, prognostic evaluation. I absolutely agree with that. And you know, there's another thing uh, which you talked about is the low NHS patients. So there's this question uh, from Dr. Kothari, like what's the protocol you follow with large vessel occlusion and low NHS? Do you wait for them to deteriorate or do you take them irrespective of the NHS? Oh, so this, is, this is clearly a matter of debate. So um, uh, we know that uh, a lot of patients with a large vessel occlusion and low NHS, they do well. 
uh, but we also know that around 20 to 30 percent will deteriorate. Um, and there are now uh, randomized controlled trials uh, ongoing, which, which will help us to, to get a probably a more precise picture uh, of, of how we, we, we should approach these patients. So we usually, if it's if, if the, the anatomy, the access, uh, if, we, if we think it's, it's, it's easy to do a thrombectomy, we rather um, tend to, um, to do it. We rather tend to go for endovascular recanalization. And we also rather tend to go for revascularization when a, a patient uh, 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 initially presented with a high NHS and then improved. Uh, so that seems to be a, a surrogate of that he's now living from his collaterals, which could at any moment could again deteriorate until he is back on an NH of 10, 12, or 15. So this is also uh, uh, something we take into, a bit, uh, into account, and, and usually we're rather proactive. But that's, that's our approach. At the moment, there is no, no clear, clear evidence uh, in favor of endovascular therapy. Uh, but if, if, if it's technically feasible, uh, which is in most cases the case, we will all attempt to, to recanalize. And on, on that, I have one uh, question. You know, some people, uh, like Dr. Mayan Goel has a paper that, you know, to raise the head end of these patients to see if they deteriorate in their NIH. The idea is that you raise the head end, the collateral will drop. So we have tried in a couple of patients and, you know, seems to work occasionally. As a, so have you tried this in your practice to see if that helps? I, I didn't know, I didn't understand it. Sorry, what 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 did you do? So so you if you raise the head end of the patient, like ah. a bit sitting upright to see whether he will deteriorate or not. Yes, yeah, so we, we, we usually ask from neurologists whether they have the impression whether there is a hemodynamic component. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they say yes, that would be another um, uh, another reason to go in there. But again we, we, we we don't really know whether this is uh, always true for every patient, yes. But that, that's another clinical hint, but uh, we don't know whether this is uh, precise enough to really uh, give us the definitive uh, hint uh, to leave the patient alone or not. Yeah. Uh, there's Thank another you. question about uh, starting antiplatelets after thrombectomy. Doctor, someone wants to ask, when do you start uh, antiplatelets after mechanical thrombectomy? Is there any particular uh, protocol that you follow? So if, if we're talking about secondary prevention, it's it's after 24 hours. Uh, and if we're talking about uh, antiplatelets because we put in a stent in the acute phase, uh, we usually give aspirin IV on the table, 250 to 500 milligrams. And then we do a control scan uh, after 6 to 12 hours. And if there is no bleeding, we will start with the second, uh, with the with, with clopidogrel as a second uh, uh, anti aggregate drug. So, uh, uh, Gaurav Sir and Dr. Subhash, like, uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, there is, there is one question which one of, the, uh, one of the participants has asked. It's an interesting question that do you routinely send your, uh, once you do mechanical thrombectomy, do you send the clot for the clot analysis? And does it help you to predict the outcome and uh, uh, secondary prevention? Uh, clot analysis. Question is about clot analysis. Yeah, we, we, we don't we don't do it on a regular basis. We just we just do it if we think this is something special. This is something uh, this is something not normal. So we have some clots which were carcinoma cells, uh, uh, calcified clots. So then we do it, but we don't do it on a routine basis. Of course, there is at the moment a used discussion whether, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, pre-interventional imaging can help you with identifying the clot composition, and then you might be able to adapt your thrombectomy technique or your thrombectomy device on that. I think that that's promising, but uh, um, but but the, the thrombi we're most interested in are those we are we're not getting out. So. Uh, um, but we don't examine them histologically on a, on a regular basis. Thank you. thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, uh, I thank you once again, Dr. Pastu, and uh, on the behalf of organizing committee, and also thank Dr. Call and Dr. Gaurav who thank give you. this precious time. Thank it you was so a much. wonderful talk, and thank you very much. Great session. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks.
Th thank you too. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, take care. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.